We will go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for being here with us today. We would like to thank the Navy Child and Youth Programs for making today's webinar on understanding financial aid for military families possible. Thank you so much for taking our poll. We see that we do have some professionals joining us as well as parents, that's fantastic. We do always welcome professionals who work with military connected children to our parent trainings. And I know that you will find the information and tips that we present very useful. Please note that our MSEC parent support webinars have been designed with parents as the target audience. Before we introduce ourselves, we wanted to share with you a bit more about MSEC and its programs. Uh, so the Military Child Education Coalition, or MSEC, is a nonprofit organization established nearly 25 years ago. Our mission is to support all military connected children by educating, advocating, and collaborating to resolve any kinds of education challenges associated with the military lifestyle. In 2005, MSEC formalized support and programming for military connected parents so that they may be empowered, informed, and proactive in supporting their children's educational journey. We strive to deliver informative and interactive webinars that address academic, social, and emotional issues associated with a military family lifestyle. Our vision is for every military-connected child to be college, work, and life ready. My name is Emily Barton. I have been with MSEC since 2018 as a parent educator and a member of the webinar team. I live in Montgomery, Alabama. My husband is active duty Air Force and we're stationed here at Maxwell Air Force Base. We have two children, one who is a freshman in college in Texas and our son is a junior in high school. I am so happy to be with all of you today to talk about this very important topic. And now I'm going to pass it over to Catherine. Thanks so much, Emily. My name is Catherine Katowski. I have been married to an active duty soldier for the past 15 years, and we have three military connected kids. They are in eighth grade, sixth grade, and fourth grade. We recently PCS here to the national capital region. We live in Northern Virginia. I've been with MSEC since early January 2021, and I'm really excited to be here with you all today. So we know that financial aid can be a very technical and sometimes tricky topic that often generates a whole lot of questions. And for that reason, we are very lucky and pleased to be joined this morning and this afternoon by with my Mark Patton. He is an MSEC military student consultant, and he will be holding a Q&A session after our presentation today. And I'm gonna let you know how to submit all of those burning financial aid questions in just a moment. But first, I would love it for Mark to unmute yourself and introduce yourself. Well, good afternoon. Uh, like I said, so I'm retired Air Force. Uh, I've done every role you can do uh, as a military, a kid, uh, a husband, a dad, and then a spouse uh, when my wife deployed. Um, I have over 30 years experience as a uh, counselor, teacher, junior ROTC instructor, and assistant professor at the Air Force Academy. Um, and I've done over 30 years worth of, of college scholarship reviews at numerous levels uh, in North Carolina, especially, but nationally with ROTC scholarships and academy uh, selection boards. Uh, look forward to uh, answering your questions today. Thanks so much, Mark. We're super excited that you're here. So we do have a couple of administrative announcements before we continue. At the end of our webinar today, we would like to invite you to take our survey about our presentation. We would really appreciate it if you would take just the two or three minutes that it requires to give us a little bit of feedback. This is the key method we use to tell our funders what we're doing. It also helps us to continue updating our webinars and continue pursuing topics that are interesting and helpful and useful to you, the military community connected parents that we serve. You should see a chat box there on your screen. If you don't see it yet, if you look at the bottom of your Zoom box, there should be a cartoon bubble. If you click on that, that chat box will pop right up for you. As I mentioned, after today's presentation, we are going to take some time for a Q&A with Mark. As he told you, he is an expert in this field. If you have any questions that you would like us to send to Mark, you'd like him to answer, just type them right there in the chat box. 
please use that chat box at any time during our presentation today. Just know that we're going to hold those questions until the end for Mark. So please put those questions and use that chat box often. Also in that chat box, you should see already a PDF file that is the downloadable resources that accompanies our webinar today. This contains a lot of resources and additional information and links that goes with our webinar. Please know if you are joining us on your phone, you may not be able to download that PDF. That's no problem. If you'll just share your email address with us in the chat box, we will make sure to email that resource to you. Please also know that our webinar today is being recorded so that you can always review this recording later if you have any te technical difficulties or particularly if you would like to share this information with somebody else. With that, we'll go ahead and get started with our information today. So our learning objectives for our, this webinar today are first to identify the potential cost of a post-secondary education at both public and private schools. We also wanna define financial aid specific terms, including some you may have heard like FAFSA, which you will hear many times today, grants, scholarships, and loans. And then we wanna explore financial aid considerations for military families. Emily? Great. Thank you so much, Catherine. All right. You're muted, Emily. Oh, can you hear me? Good. Okay, great. All right. So there are over 6,000 degree granting two and four year colleges and universities in the United States. This is wonderful because it leaves our students with lots of options. However, the sheer number of options can be overwhelming. Deciding between colleges may be further complicated by our military lifestyle. For example, upcoming PCS moves or being stationed overseas can make it difficult when selecting a college. And today, the process of selecting a college is very different from when our students' parents applied to college. Many families become overwhelmed by the potential cost and worry that it may not be accessible to their children. The good news is that there are ways to keep the cost manageable because there are lots of different options and opportunities. To learn more about selecting a college, we do encourage you to watch our webinar on selecting a college that fits. One of the most important considerations when selecting a college that fits is the financial impact on both the student and the parents. The tuition is the price that a college charges for the actual classes. The cost of tuition and fees varies, and this can change from year to year. Average co total cost for a year at college at a four-year school in the years 2020 to 2021, including tuition and fees, on-campus room and board, books, supplies, and other expenses was $35,852, which is approximately $142,000 over four years. When it comes to tuition, private schools typically have the same tuition rate for all students. Public schools have separate in-state and out-of-state tuition rates. Keep in mind that state residency is not necessarily the same as fulfilling in-state tuition requirements. Different states have different requirements and even schools within the same state can vary. Don't assume that you qualify for in-state tuition. Make sure to always check with the school's financial aid office. That's very important. There are things to keep in mind when considering military families and that in-state versus out-of-state tuition. Military families do have several options for in-state tuition under the Higher Education Opportunity Act, Section 114. Active duty families and their dependents get in-state tuition rates at the sponsor's legal state of residence, which is usually the state that's listed on their leave and earnings statement where they pay state taxes. When permanently stationed in the state where the public school is located, there's generally no wait time for the student to qualify for that in-state tuition. 
as and as long as the student is remains continuously enrolled, they will keep that in state rate, even if the sponsor is transferred to another location. Some schools give resident rates to all students with military connections. However, this is not guaranteed. If a student is using the transferred GI Bill benefits, they are eligible for in-state tuition rates under the Veterans Choice Act. And again, never assume that you qualify for that in-state tuition as a military family. Make sure to always talk with the school's financial aid office before committing to a school. So now we'll talk for a minute about the cost of attendance or the COA. The COA is the amount it will actually cost a student to go to school. Most two-year and four-year colleges calculate that COA to show the total cost for the school year, including both fall and spring semesters. However, college costs do go beyond that tuition and include many considerations that you can see here. There are school fees uh, beyond tuition. They might include lab fees, student health insurance. My daughter's uh, college program has a performance fee. You'll also want to consider room and board. Is your student going to live at home or on campus or off campus? You'll want to consider meals and groceries. Will the student need a full or partial meal plan? Sometimes freshmen are required to, to pay for a full meal plan. Will they need to cook their own meals and buy groceries? They may live in an apartment or have a suite with a shared kitchen, or perhaps they have dietary restrictions which may limit meal plan options. There are also uh, fees for extracurricular activities that you'll want to consider, including clubs, uh, sports, Greek life. Uh, you'll also want to consider transportation fees. Will your student be driving to campus? They'll need gas money. Will they have a car on campus? This often requires a parking permit, which will likely include a fee. Will the student need to travel home during breaks? This may require a plane ticket or even international travel for families living overseas. Additionally, there are always those unexpected costs. It's really not easy to predict emergency situations or those unplanned costs that are associated with school. When you're determining the cost, the net price is the true amount that a student will pay for college. This is the published price of tuition, room, and board, uh, including fees for a college, minus the amount of financial aid, including grants, scholarships that a student receives, and that yields that net price. The net price calculator is an online tool which provides a personalized estimate of what it will cost to attend a specific college. Most colleges are required by law to post a net price calculator on their school website. Additionally, the US Department of Education provides a net price calculator center. This is part of the College Affordability and Transparency Center website. When you go to this website, you can search for colleges by name and access their net price calculator. This assists with finding school specific net prices that can be personalized for your student. It helps you make an informed decision. Uh, and keep in mind that when you're using this net price calculator, you will likely need the parents and students financial information. So like taxes, mortgage, income information to ensure that accurate estimate. And you can see uh, in the chat box, we have a link to that website. All right, so now we are going to watch a video that provides an overview of the net price calculator. You're a high school student, or you're a junior college student, or you're just an individual looking to further your education. 
You want to go to a four-year university, but you don't know how much it'll cost. You look up the cost of the university on the web, but all you find is confusing websites with inaccurate information. What there's a place you could go that provides accurate information on the cost of going to a particular school. Well, there is. The U.S. Department of Education has a program that requires universities to show their net price. What is net price? Net price is the amount that a student pays to attend an institution in a single academic year after subtracting scholarships and grants you receive. Colleges are required to also show estimated tuition and fees, estimated room and board, estimated books and supplies, estimated total grant aid, estimated net price, and other information. There are a couple of ways to find out the net price of a particular school. You can go to the university's website and look up their net price calculator. Or you can go to nces.ed.gov slash college navigator. Once you're there, you simply look up the school, click net price, and there it is. And now you have a great start to becoming a future college student. So we are going to put that link to the net price, the College Navigator, right there in your chat box. This is a really great resource for calculating actual college costs. It is, as we saw in the video, it's a national, it's by the National Center for Education Statistics, and it offers this wealth of information about colleges and universities. It includes a list of potential colleges that you can actually use the navigator to compare the cost of schools. It details expenses and provides detailed breakdown of associated expenses, including in and out of state tuition when you're evaluating those things. And we put that link there in your chat box. And there are also links there, including a net price break, a net price breakdown and some links to the college's net price calculator for um, estimated personalized estimates. So some, let's talk about some ways to pay for college, because there are lots of different ways, and we're going to go through each one of these individually, but the ones that we're going to talk about today are grants and scholarships, which are money that the student does not have to pay back, and they come from multiple sources. Then we have loans, which is money that students are required to pay back, and some of those payments may even begin while the student is still in school. There are also personal savings, which are personal savings or college savings plans that a family has already put together before the student starts college. Tuition discounts are something we're going to talk about today, too. Some states and regions offer tuition discounts, and but often require that the student meet certain requirements to qualify for those discounts. And also, there are work study or job programs where the student actually works through school to assist with paying their tuition. And then we're going to talk a little bit today about military benefits, including the post-9-11 GI Bill, Chapter 35 benefits, the Yellow Ribbon Program, and some state-specific benefits. And first, we're going to go ahead and start off by talking about financial aid and the FAFSA. Financial aid is money that the government or other organizations give or lend to the student so that the student can then pay for college. To qualify for financial aid, students have to apply to be considered for it. And that application process begins with filling out the free application for federal student aid, also known as the FAFSA. And some schools will also require, in addition to the FAFSA, they will also require another, it's called the CSS profile for financial consideration for those schools. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But the FAFSA is used to determine eligibility for financial aid from the federal government, from state governments, and even from the colleges themselves. Know that as you're filling out the FAFSA that it's going to require prior prior year tax information. So for example, if you have a student that is filling out the FAFSA for the 2023-2024 school year, they will use tax information from 2022 and 2021. So it's important that you have that information available when you're filling it out. The FAFSA opens on October 1st of every year, and we highly advise families to fill out that application as soon as possible, as soon as the new one is available. And do know that it's going to require financial information from both the student and from the student's parents. Undergraduate students are typically considered dependents, even if they're filing their own taxes. And there's a lot more information on the FAFSA website, and we will put that in, in your chat box in just a moment. We also have another video to give you another quick of overview of the FAFSA.
Our dreams for the future inspire us, drive us, uplift us. Making them a reality starts with an education. Don't think you can afford it? There is help. You can apply for grants, loans, work-study funds, and certain scholarships by filling out the free application for federal student aid, or FAFSA form. October 1st is the date the application becomes available for the following school year. You should fill it out ASAP to meet your state, school, and federal deadlines. More on that in a moment. To be eligible for federal student aid, you must be a U.S. citizen or an eligible non-citizen, such as a U.S. national or permanent resident, have a valid social security number, have a high school diploma or equivalent, and be enrolled or accepted as a student in an eligible degree or certificate program. Check out studentaid.gov slash eligibility for more criteria and details. There are a few things you need to have on hand when filling out your FAFSA form. You'll need your social security number, alien registration number if you're not a U.S. citizen, federal income tax returns, W-2s, and other records of money earned, bank statements and investment records if applicable, records of untaxed income if applicable, and FSA ID, account username and password to sign electronically. If you're a dependent student, your parents will need most of this information too. Finally, let's talk deadlines. Besides federal government aid, you may also be eligible for aid from your state and school. And to be considered for that aid, you have to fill out the FAFSA form in time. Visit the FAFSA deadline section at studentaid.gov FAFSA. Make sure to mark your calendar for the cutoff date for your state and school. Better yet, just remember to apply ASAP after October 1st. To make sure you don't miss out on any aid you're eligible to receive, you must fill out your FAFSA form each year you plan to attend school. Start turning your dream into a reality today at fafsa.gov. So another thing that we want to make you aware of is the FAFSA Simplification Act. We won't go into great detail about it today, but there are just a couple of things to know about it as you're approaching those years where you may be filling out FAFSAs for your, with your student. The FAFSA Simplification Act represents a pretty significant overhaul of the federal student aid, including the FAFSA form, the needs analysis, and some policies and procedures for participating schools. Some major aspects of this new legislation include replacing the expected family contribution, also known as the EFC, with the student aid index, which you will hear referred to as the SAI. And this is just a different measure of a family's ability to pay for college. The act will also hopefully is intended to expand access to federal student aid, including expansion of the federal Pell Grants. And also, it is intended to streamline the FAFSA form with by removing some questions about selective service registration, drug convictions, and then adding some additional questions about race, ethnicity. And we put a link there in your chat box so you can look at the details. But we just wanted you to know that this is on the horizon since a lot of the provisions of the act will start applying for 2023 to 2024 school year and even the following year after that. So we also mentioned the CSS profile. This is the College Scholarship Service Profile, which is an additional financial aid form required by some colleges, not all. The, this is administered by the College Board, and this is a form that you would fill out in addition to the FAFSA. So you would still want to fill out the FAFSA first, and then if your school requires it, the CSS profile. Some private colleges and a few state-supported schools will require this form. The important thing, as Emily said before, always the important thing, check with the school's financial aid office if it's a school that your student is considering. They use a, institutional methodologies to award financial aid, and typically that CSS profile will require supplemental information to then perform a separate need analysis in determining your student's eligibility for aid, which is directly controlled by that particular school. So it's going to be information 
in addition to the information that you provided in the FAFSA. But know that each school's CSS profile may ask different questions from another school. So again, really important to check with that specific school's financial aid office. Because some schools have these really large endowments or aid that they can then directly control and have the final say in terms of who can be awarded money out of those out of those funds. So a couple of takeaways as we talk about financial aid, just remember that it's not the total cost of tuition that's as important as the portion of the total cost that your student must pay. Some students didn't necessarily have to pay more for an exclusive private school than they did for a state school based on the available funding and scholarship options at the private school. So, and again, to learn more about FAFSA and the CSS profile application process, we actually have a webinar dedicated specifically to those topics for military families. And we'll put the links to that in your chat box. Emily? Great, thank you. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about grants and scholarships. Financial aid eligibility is based on the FAFSA and may result in grants and scholarships. So what is the difference between the two? Both are free money and don't have to be paid back. The federal and state governments are the primary sources of grants. Colleges also give out grants and scholarships. Be aware that in some cases, a grant may convert to a loan if certain obligations aren't met. So for example, if you're if the student has a low GPA or drops out of college, grants are based on fin financial need. Scholarships may be based on financial need. However, they're usually awarded based on merit or major or qualities such as athletic ability or academic achievement. When it comes to federal grants, there are several types. There are the Pell Grants and Federal Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grants, which are given to undergraduate students with exceptional financial need. There are also uh, teacher education assistance for college and higher education grants or TEACH grants in which the student must commit to serving as full-time teachers in high need fields for a required period of time. There are also Iraq and Afghanistan service grants for children of deceased Iraq or Afghanistan veterans who served after 9-11. For specific information and requirements for federal grants, visit the grant section of the Federal Student Aid website and that you'll see in your chat box. There are also private grants and scholarships. Many different organizations and businesses offer this type of financial aid. You can actually search for scholarships on national or state websites for this. MSEC SchoolQuest is a fantastic tool that does have scholarship finder links on the website, as well as links to state and military connected scholarships and grants. We use this uh, prior to our daughter going off to college and it's a great resource. There are also other sources for scholarship opportunities. Uh, check out the financial aid office at the specific colleges uh, that your child is looking at or career schools. You can also go to your school count, your high school counselor for ideas. The library's reference section usually has a list of, of scholarship opportunities. You can also look into different foundations or religious or community organizations local businesses or civic groups. My daughter uh, received a Lions Club scholarship. So there are all kinds of civic groups that offer this type of scholarship. There are also organizations, including professional associations, related to your field of interest. There are ethnicity-based organizations, as well as your student's employer or parent's employer may offer different scholarships. There are also financial um, or scholarships for, for children of military personnel. There are a vast array of military scholarships. Check out military professional associations or unit specific scholarships, as well as military connected nonprofits or spouses clubs. Those are a great resource for scholarships. 
Additionally, the Fisher House Scholarship Database can be very helpful. This has links to hundreds of military connected scholarships. You can search based on specific criteria such as the your branch of service or member status or your student's major. The US Veterans Magazine also provides a list of specific military scholarships for uh, service members, spouses, and dependents. For more information on applying for scholarships, we'd love for you to watch our specific webinar on scholarship do's and don'ts for military families. It can be very helpful. And you'll see, uh, I think we're going to put the link to that in your chat box. We'll also talk now a little bit about federal loans. Keep in mind that loans are funds that your student will need to pay back. The interest rates and payment requirements are loan dependent. You do need to fill out that FAFSA to be considered for federal loans. There are direct subsidized loans and direct unsubsidized loans. These are both versatile low interest loans Students don't need a credit check or a co-signer to get most of these federal student loans, and they don't have to begin repaying federal student loans until after they leave college or drop down below half-time enrollment. The major difference between these two is that subsidized loans are based on financial need and the government pays for the accrued interest while the student is going to college. Unsubsidized loans are not based on financial need and the borrower is responsible for that accrued interest. There are also direct PLUS loans, which are unsubsidized loans for parents of dependent undergraduate students. The US Department of Education is the lender and the maximum PLUS loan amounts uh, equals the cost of attendance determined by the school minus any other financial aid that the student receives. The borrower for these direct plus loans is responsible for the accrued interest, and you must not have an adverse credit history to receive one of these. You can also get loans from private sources such as banks or other organizations. Make sure to carefully weigh those pros and cons when considering taking out loans. That's very important. Individual states also offer financial aid. Uh, some states provide this financial support to eligible residents. So for example, California has the Cal Grant and in New York, they offer the New York State Tuition Assistance Program or TAP. According to the Federal Student Aid website, Every state has its own funds and process for distributing aid, which often consists of grants and scholarships. Some states only require that you complete a FAFSA form, while other states require families to complete a separate application. It's very important to submit that FAFSA form early to increase eligibility. For some states, that college aid is first come, first served. Reach out to the financial aid office at the colleges that your student is considering, as well as the state grant agency for more specifics. Additionally, there is financial aid that's often offered from colleges. Make sure to check out your school's financial aid web website or contact that financial aid office at the, the college to find out what grants and scholarships the school offers. Students will receive a financial aid award letter from the school, which will list the grants and scholarships that the student will receive. Sometimes schools do require students to fill out additional applications for more school specific financial aid. Some schools even require students to complete the FAFSA to receive any scholarships, including those merit based awards. So it's important to get the FAFSA filled out. 
some schools require students to apply for early admission to be eligible for merits merit scholarships. So just find out from the college all of those details. It's also very important to check the deadlines, not only for federal and state aid, but also each college's deadlines for, for, for submitting that FAFSA form. Another option for aid includes state and regional tuition discounts. Many states do have programs that let their students, their, or excuse me, their residents attend college in another state. You'll want to check with your state or college to see if those tuition exchange or reciprocal programs are available and learn how to apply for that discount. A few of the larger programs are divided into the Southern, Midwestern, Western, and New England region, which you can see here on the slide. So for example, say you're a resident of Washington State and your student wants to study in California. Both states fall under that Western region, and so your student may request tuition discounts at participating two and four year colleges in California, even though they live in Washington state. Depending on the region or state, your student will need to apply to get that reduced tuition rate or pursue an approved major to get the discount. And keep in mind that some schools do limit the number of students that get that discount, so make sure to apply early to ensure that this is an option. Some families were able to create college savings plans when their children were younger. There's both the 529 plans and the Coverdale education savings accounts. These are flexible, they offer tax savings and can help pay for qualified education expenses. There are distinct differences between the two, so be sure to check your plan stipulations before using those funds to ensure that you comply with the withdrawal rules and the money usage. Also, if you do live close to a military installation, consider reaching out to the installation personal financial management program for help. You can also get in touch with Military OneSource for free personal financial counseling. It can be very helpful. Thanks, Emily. So talking about Veterans Affairs programs, there are three frequently used programs for dependent education, the post 9-11 GI Bill, Chapter 35 benefits and the yellow ribbon program. So we'll start with those post 9-11 GI Bill benefits. This, as most folks know, is an entitlement that actually goes to the service member, but dependents can use it with DOD approved transfer of entitlement, also known as a TOE. Know that that, that transfer must be made while the service member is still on active duty. Dependent children then can apply for up to 36 months of benefits if they're eligible and then need the funding to cover school costs. And that 36 months can be split among more than one child, but it's still the total is only 36 months of benefits. Also, the student is not required to use those benefits if there are other funding sources. Funding from the post 9-11 GI Bill covers tuition, covers housing through a stipend, and also can be used to cover books. And each school has a VA school certifying official who then assists with completing the application with the VA. And, but before your student commits to a school, talk with the college's certifying official to learn how they process that GI Bill application. And you can also use the VA's GI Bill comparison tool to learn about and then compare the GI Bill benefits at approved schools. I'm going to put that right there in your chat box. Another benefit to know about from the VA are Chapter 35 Survivors and Dependents Educational Assistance Benefits. These are based on a service member's status. The most common situation is a veteran or service member who is permanently and totally disabled, basically has a 100% rating, or is deceased due to service-connected dis disability. Uh, under Chapter 35 benefits, students would receive a monthly stipend that's actually paid directly to the dependent, to the student, rather than to the school. And those monthly payments can then be used to cover the cost of 
college or graduate degree programs, career training certificate courses, educational and career counseling, and also apprenticeships or on the job training. And we will put a link to those for more information about those chapter 35 benefits in your chat box here in just a moment. Another program to know about is the Yellow Ribbon Program. This program is actually used in conjunction with post 9-11 GI Bill benefits to supplement the amount that the VA pays to the school. And that's because the VA puts a yearly cap on how much it pays for tuition. And some schools, particularly private schools or schools with, if your student is going somewhere out of state and there's out of state tuition, can exceed that yearly cap that the VA is paying. If a school chooses to participate in the Yellow Ribbon Program, they will then put money towards those out-of-pocket expenses that go beyond that yearly cap paid out by the VA. And some important things to know about the Yellow Ribbon Program. Schools voluntarily enter the Yellow Ribbon Program, so not every single school participates in the program, so it's very important to check. Also, each school chooses the amount of tuition and fees that they will then contribute. And many colleges also limit the number of students that they accept under the Yellow Ribbon Program. So if your student is looking at a school with, with potential yellow, yellow Ribbon Program benefits, apply early. And also check Yellow Ribbon benefits participation status and funding level before your student commits, because like we said, every single school can be different. And so we're going to put those links in your chat box. And again, we have other we have a GI Bill and Yellow Ribbon Program uh, webinars that you can also check out that go into a few more specifics. So one thing I and if you want to use your emojis, if you see emoji reactions, if you want to give an emoji a thumbs up, can you negotiate your financial aid award letter with your school? And if you think you can, hit me with a thumbs up. If you think you can actually negotiate an award even after you have got, I see a few, I see at least one thumbs up. I think the answer might be, I don't know if it's obvious or not, but the answer is yes, you actually can. You can negotiate and you should negotiate your student's financial aid award. Colleges are like businesses. And if your student has been accepted at their dream school, but their financial aid award letter is just not going to be enough to make it happen, contact the financial aid office and have a discussion. If you have extenuating circumstances, communicate that with the college's financial aid office, even if you already have that letter in hand. Things like unexpected high medical bills, or if a parent has been laid off, or if there's a significant change in salary or other circumstance that might apply or might matter to the financial aid office, and the school might be able to help you. But be prepared, try to negotiate. I Nothing bad can come of it. Really, it doesn't hurt to ask for more. And you may be surprised at what, what the financial aid office can do for you. So some final thoughts as we are wrapping up today before we get to our Q&A session. Uh, just some things to take away. First, remember to start this process early. Begin research no later than the summer between your students' junior and senior year. Really kick off that process and start looking into the cost of schools and what needs to be done to make meet those costs. Also, complete that FAFSA. Make sure your student fills out that FAFSA to maximize both federal and state aid. And also work together with your student to ensure that they fully understand the cost of college and then can make an informed decision, especially if you're considering loans of ever, any kind. Make sure your student fully understands what taking those loans out will mean for them after, even after they leave college. So we're going to get to that Q&A session, but really quick, we want to run through a few great resources that MSEG provides that we'd love for you to know about. But also we would love, as I mentioned before, we would love your feedback on our presentation today. If you would just take a couple of minutes to fill out that survey, which you can access using that QR code on your screen or in a link that we'll put in your chat box in just a moment, you will need your webinar code, which is 3623 for this webinar. If you're not able to do it right now, you will receive an email with the survey link that you can take it then. Also, if you would like to access the recordings of this or any other webinar, you can access those on our website at militarychild.org slash webinars. And you can access any of webinar, our webinars there. If you are interested in our online professional development trainings, you can also access those at our militarychild.org website. 
As we mentioned, Emily mentioned School Quest, which is a really fantastic tool, online tool for parents of military connected children. We it's free to register, free to use. You can use that QR code there right on your screen to access School Quest. Great place to get more information, to set up a digital profile or excuse me, digital portfolio for your student, and just a ton of other really fantastic resources. And like I said, it's totally free, so check it out. We also want to let you know about our military student consultants. Our MSCs are the premier resource for information if you ever have any educated related, education related questions with respect to your military connected child. Any crazy wild question that happens that you can't get an answer to, all you need to do is shoot an email or a phone call to one of our MSCs, one of whom is here with us today, Mark, and they will, if they can't answer it right away, they will get back to you with the answer. So we, it's a great, really fantastic resource. Another great resource from MSEC that is totally free is the Wellbeing Toolkit. The Wellbeing Toolkit was developed for parents, school professionals, behavioral and mental health experts and professionals and community leaders. It is packed full of resources for all aspects of military connected child's well-being. We really encourage you to use that QR code on your screen and check it out. It is a whole library of resources. Also, as I think a lot of people know, next month is month of the military child. It is April and the 2023 MSEC month of the military child toolkit is available now. You can access it using that QR code and you can see that poster. You can download that poster for free and use it at your school or wherever it is that you might be having a month of military child celebration. Also, the MSEC Global Training Summit registration is open. We would love for you to join us to celebrate our 25th anniversary in Washington, D.C. in July. Registration can be accessed right there using that QR code on your screen um, from July 24th to July 26th. Also, know that if you are part of a student-to-student -student team at a school, that we invite students to the student experience if they're part of a student-to-student -student team to reserve your team spot. Again, you can just use that QR code on your screen or that link that you see there to sign your students up for, again, for GTS. And finally, we have Call for the Arts. Call for the Arts is now open. If you have a student military connected artist, we would love to see their artwork. You can use that QR code on your screen to submit their artwork for consideration and submissions will be taken until April 6th. If you're looking for a certificate of completion for any webinar that is recorded, if you want one for this one, you will all you have to do is fill out the survey that you'll receive by email. For any other recorded webinar, just send an email to research at militarychild.org. We have upcoming webinars next week include transitions for military connected students with special needs on Tuesday and developing resilience through mindfulness on Wednesday, March 22nd, and all of our webinars start at noon. We want to extend a very special thank you to the Navy Child and Youth Programs for making today's webinar possible, and thank you to all of you for being here.